everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Danny Nirenberg. I am president and co-founder with Bernie Pollock of Food Tank. We're so thrilled you could all be here today. Um, I, this has just been an extraordinary week so far. We're so glad to be part of South by Southwest. Please use uh, the hashtag future food South by Southwest if you have questions during this film or if you have any comments. We really want to hear them. Um, so we're about to see a film that gives insight into the really complex issues of how we raise food across the world, immigration policy, and the very, very important role of farm workers. So again, please use the hashtag future food South by Southwest and share your thoughts and questions, and then we'll have a great discussion with Soren Bjorn, Bjorn, the president of Driscoll's of the Americas, afterwards. So I'll see you back here in about 20 minutes. Thanks, everyone. used to be cost of water, cost of land, but right now our biggest challenge is labor. It takes a lot of people. Crops we're in take a lot of people. Estamos recortando los acres que estamos plantando porque no tenemos la mano de obra para cosechar. What if you went to the store and there were no strawberries that week, you know? I think that would wake people's minds up. I used to be a harvester, you know, strawberries, raspberries, and do all kinds of things up here in the field. But uh, that's probably where I acquire my passion for agriculture. I wanted to be a grower, and it took a lot of years. With a lot of effort, a lot of effort. I mean, you have to sacrifice a lot of time and save your, all your money for a lot of years. Ya llegaron las primeras, Mari. La fruta se ve bien ahora, Mari. There's a lot of barriers, but uh, I guess the, the major one is in your head. You have to have the passion to do it. I'm here every day. I don't care if it's a Sunday. <laughs> gotta harvest, gotta irrigate, groundwork, weeding, Plants don't take any days off. The way I see it is not only me, it's my family, 80 or 100 people that are working for me. So in a way, I have to feed all those families, you know. It's a big uh, responsibility. A lot of agriculture in the United States is grown by families and companies that aren't that big. The smaller farms tend to be the most successful, actually and there's hundreds of growers trying to grow good food people really want to eat. Yo vine, vengo de un rancho en México muy, muy chiquito donde mi papá criaba vacas, criaba puercos, criaba gallinas, de todo ahí. So esa era mi visión. Quiero ser lo que él hace, pero, pero más grande. No todos a lo mejor tenemos la misma oportunidad, pero los que tenemos la oportunidad es pensar en crear para todos los demás. Fue una de las, de, de las motivaciones de, de cada vez crecer más, crecer más. We've been growing here for 75 years. It's uh, quite an honor to be uh, around that long. I was a history major and I, I figured I could either be a high school teacher or a strawberry grower, so I thought strawberry growing was a little more exciting. And I think, you know, it's the passion that we have for growing. I think it's the people you get to work with and the stories and over the years. I think that's been the tradition of the Sheehy's here in San Maria Valley and, you know, I want it to continue.
I've been interested in agriculture ever since I was a teenager and have just really admired farm workers all that time. I've worked in agriculture for about 15 years and started my career in agriculture at Fair Trade USA. My passion is how can you help all of the actors in a supply chain thrive in a way that brings a beautiful product to market. In many cultures around the world, people are still close to their farming heritage, and I think we've lost some of that in the U.S. We don't necessarily know where food comes from or who picked it. And the reality is that farm workers that were born most likely in Mexico picked your food. Today, where we really have trouble is in the farm work itself. We're not seeing people that are needed to work in the harvest. When it comes to the harvesting part, I mean, you gotta have the people or else you're gonna lose your crop. Plants and fruit don't wait a week. <laughs> if you don't allow for a new supply of labor that's willing to do those jobs, those jobs just aren't going to get done. And in this case, the fruit is not going to get picked. Fue un punto donde tuvimos que tomar la decisión de cuál pescar o no pescar porque estaba, estábamos tan cortos con mano de obra que decidimos por, por ir a la, las nuevas rojas y, y dejar las blueberries. Yeah, sometimes we're behind schedule because we're short on labor and we got to make sure that we're harvesting the berries at the right time in order not to end up with a product like this. And you can tell the difference on the quality. So all this has to go away, has to be thrown away to juice. Y es triste porque toda esta fruta está haciendo falta en el mercado, pero pero no hay quien la pisque. I've met a lot of growers that have had to leave fruit on the tree and lost millions of dollars of investment they made when they couldn't get enough labor. Every year we're seeing less and less people showing up from Mexico, which I know is political issues with the border. About a decade ago, enforcement at the border got much more strict. And so the numbers of people that were crossing the border to work in agriculture dropped dramatically. So that's really what's led to a massive shortage in farm workers. As the borders got tightened up, the U.S. never addressed where we are, what we need, what's realistic. 20 years ago, it was just like an unlimited amount of people that you had at your uh, avail. If you grow it, they will come. Todo eso ha cambiado. Y hoy en día más bien estamos buscando esas personas y no están llegando. Yo soy líder de cuadrilla, yo soy mayordoma de, este, de esta cuadrilla. O sea, a mí mi patrón me dice que, que necesita 30 personas para trabajar para levantar la fresa. A veces nada más llegan 20 personas. Y por ejemplo, ahorita yo aquí tengo, ahorita andan como 17. Y aunque yo diga que quiero gente, quiero gente, pero no hay gente, no hay. Pues yo pienso que to todo mundo sabe lo necesario que es la mano de obra del campo. Y ahorita la mano de obra se está terminando, ¿por, ¿por qué? Por, por el, ¿Será el racismo o porque el gobierno de aquí piensa que nosotros no, no nos, nos hacemos falta aquí? Sin saber que somos los que estamos levantando el país. La realidad es que a lot of people come to the States paying high fees of uh, $5,000 to $10,000 to cross the border. You're not gonna pay or earn that amount of money in one or two years. So what does that mean to those people? I mean, they have to separate from their families. Hasta 15 años hay trabajadores que no van a ver su familia. No es fácil, creo que tiene muchos retos que pasar para llegar aquí. Si se supieran ellos bien de pasar el trabajo que duran para pasar la línea, a veces que mucha gente se queda ahí hasta las matan en, en, los, en los desiertos. Hay muy pocas personas que todavía, como estaba diciendo anterior, van a tomar el riesgo. Creo que cada vez va a ser menos. I don't mind if they change the laws on immigration and make it tougher. They just got to get us a workforce first. <laughs> you know, don't do, don't make the law without a solution. <laughs> In the U.S., there are 1.3 million farm workers today, and that's decreased pretty dramatically over the last 20 years. There's victims to it. A lot of the farm workers, a consumer, 
there'll be a lot of people that lose out if it can't be a more thoughtful debate. We have this massive shortage of workers in agriculture to pick our food. If we want to have fresh food, we need to find a way to bring people that are willing to do that job. It's almost like an adverse consequence of being a wealthy society, you know, has made farm work almost inappropriate. My son, Luis, so I invited him to join me on the farm. And he says, I work too much. He says he doesn't want to end up like me. <laughs> we tried uh, recruiting at the high schools of the four large high schools we went to. I think we had six kids show up and stuff. So, you know, it's just, it's just a different world out there. This is my perception, and I think people, whenever they see a farm worker, they don't think like, wow, that person, they are harvesting what I am going to put on my table. They don't give it the respect that it merits. I think it's a very, very respectful job. It's a hard job physically, and you just don't have Americans that want to do that job. I picked berries a couple summers when I was a teenager. It's really tough being down low, and I never could pick as fast as the regular workers. I still feel the pain in my back when I used to be a harvester. It's a hard work, difficult work that no one wants to do, or many people want to do. The evidence is that some sort of guest worker program will be really necessary. There is a guest worker program in the U.S., but it seems to be intentionally designed to be difficult, expensive, not very timely, not very flexible so that not many people would use it. A big part of the challenge with the current guest worker program is that growers have to plan very far in advance how many workers to bring in, and weather determines everything with your crop. It can move it forward a couple weeks, it can move it back a couple weeks, it can cut your crop in half. Growers really need a more flexible guest worker program in order to meet the needs they have, but not end up with twice the staff that they need. I think it's gonna be really important for the government and society to work together. We need to have a better guest worker program than what's currently available to growers. Debe haber una forma de traer personas legales para que puedan venir y trabajar, porque se necesita y se van a necesitar. Necesitamos que haya gente. Una vez entendiendo eso, vamos a estar de acuerdo en, en hacer algo y buscar algo que trabaje para personas como yo que necesitamos trabajadores, los trabajadores que necesitan trabajo y a los que lo consumen. Es todo, todo lo que estamos esperando. Nada más, no, no importa que sean permisos temporales, que si nos ve, saben, digan, ¿saben qué? En seis meses, seis meses se van a ir. Perfecto, es lo que todos estamos pidiendo. Es no estarnos escondiendo de nadie. So somos parte del país y lo que venimos es a trabajar. Most of the industry knows that most of the workers in agriculture are undocumented. If they were to speak up and really make it an issue, that makes them a target. Farmers aren't willing to talk about it um, because they don't want to be the next audit. It's gotten really severe recently. We have fields that were grown, beautifully grown, and we just couldn't get them picked. Personalmente sientes que todo tu trabajo se está yendo a la basura. Mucho calor. Lo ideal sería tener tapado ya. Los limitantes, pues, lo que hemos comentado es falta de personal que tenemos. Hiciste todo tu trabajo, imagina cuánto tiempo nos tomó desde preparar el suelo, las plantas, crecerlas, talas regando, talas cuidando. Y lo peor que te puede pasar es, es ver, ver el producto ya listo para cosechar y no poder cosecharlo. El, el ver cómo se, se nos queda ahí, se nos está obligando a mejor reducir a que si no plantarlos. The solutions are to cut back acreage, but what you cut, you'll lose money on.
I don't want to downsize. I would like to grow, but I need to be more secure that I'm going to have enough labor. You've got all this investment, millions and millions of dollars out here, and you know, that's kind of scary. That's why I just front my operation. What would make a lot of sense is if the workers that have been dedicating years to picking our food, that they can have legal status so they can live and work without fear here and continue to help us get the fresh food we want. My family, we farmed this since the early 50s, all this, and now we've got a Walmart in here. And a little strange to see all this stuff on a piece of ground that you used to farm strawberries on. And strawberry acreage has shrunk in Santa Maria for three years in a row now. The thing is, is that, you know, if you don't have the farms, what are you going to have? <laughs> the variety will diminish. You're kind of seeing a lot of growers going to more automated types of growing, like celery and lettuce. That all you have to do is put the seed in and then cultivate with one tractor. So here's the healthiest things we could be eating are being really squeezed, the result will be less supply and more expensive on the things we should all be eating more of. A lo mejor va a hacer falta la fruta en el mercado para nuestros hijos, a las familias que la necesitan por falta de la mano de obra y es seria la, la situación. I would like to grow our own product up here in the States and we just fix the labor part of it. We don't have any options of not changing our systems. So one of the challenges is recognizing what's still really valuable in the environment we operate and what isn't anymore that we have to change. The big part is getting over the hump to get doing something. We started already by changing the way we do agriculture. Estamos trabajando en cómo hacer el trabajo más fácil para toda esta gente, que sea menos difícil para ellos. Driscoll's is experimenting with these new tabletops that would expand our workforce greatly um, if we were able to get people to stand up and pick instead of bending over all day. by transferring the soil farming into pots. We definitely gonna see a better environment up here in the field, a cleaner environment. Es más eficiente también para escarse y costo de manos de, de obra. Cada vez de que necesitamos remover, sacamos la planta en, en, en vez de trabajar la tierra y eso. Yo creo que el futuro vamos a vivir creciendo todas macetas. This type of jobs are going to be more comfortable, more appealing to the harvester. But it's going to be a big game changer. So we have to do a better job of transferring knowledge and experience and, and faith to be in agriculture in order to see new generations dedicate time to produce food. We're not gonna be able to do it on our own. I mean, we need some type of uh, support from people, you know, to understand the agricultural problems that we're facing right now. If we let our fear of immigrants take control, that will mean we just simply won't have enough workers to pick healthy, fresh food. But if we fail, it's going to be less and less and less people that are going to be willing to get into act. If we create a immigration policy that allows our economy to keep growing by filling these jobs that Americans don't want, we can have fresh food on our tables. We can have beautiful farms as a part of our community. We're not trying to do anything very complicated. Just trying to grow good food people really want to eat.
please. Soren, I'm so excited you're here. We've been talking for, I think, a long time, me and your team and you, and it's so nice to meet, finally meet you in person. I'm so glad you could be here. Um, you've been with Driscoll's a long time now, and I know you like to remind folks that it is a family-owned business for over 100 years, am I right? That's correct. And there are over 900 independent growers around the world that you work with. That's right, yeah. That's a very important point. I think a lot of people don't actually understand that about Driscoll, so I just wanted to make sure that that was out there. And I also wanted to see if there was anything else about the company that you wanted folks to know before we get started with the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, growing berries is, is not something you easily do on a very large scale. That, uh, there's not a 400-acre strawberry farm out there that's better than the best 100-acre strawberry mm. farm. And so uh, this doesn't really lend itself to be, you know, big ag. And um, in some ways, our company is, is more like a co-op that we organize all these farmers, there's about 900 in total, some of which are as small as five acres. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a couple of big ones in there, for sure. Sure. Um, and we really help them you know, in our brands, take their, their fruit to the market. And I think the other thing in, in our model that's maybe quite different is in, in ag, we often talk about how the farmer is disconnected from the consumer. This is something we I mean, really, really take very, very serious to try to make that connection. So we take the farmers to the market, you know, we have them see their product on the shelves, especially when the quality is not very good. So remind them that that's not what we want. Okay, we want something else. Mm. And um, in our model, about 85% of the revenue we collect from the market goes back to that farmer in the community. And because most of the farmers are of the community, that means that most of the revenue goes back to that community. So whether it's a small little town on a, in a, on a mountaintop in Mexico or Oxnard or San Maria, you saw her in the film. Um, and we take a lot of pride in that. We do think that's a part of the, the, the agriculture world that's under threat. So we have a very serious program to bring new farmers in mm -hmm. and help them when they're really, really small, right. you know, to get up to speed. Absolutely. Thanks for the explanation. That's really helpful. I know this film went through a lot of evolution, and it, it came out sort of differently than I, I'm sure that what you envisioned at the beginning. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that process. I mean, all films sort of end up that way, I'm sure. But this one in particular, I think, had some different kinds of challenges because of the immigration policy that's happening or not happening in this country. Yeah, I mean, it was filmed at a very interesting time. <laughs> okay, we had a different president in this country, so it was a bit tough to go out and talk about these issues. I probably should have started by admitting that this was not the original idea for the film. Um, Fran Dillard, who runs our marketing department, she's here. That's Fran. And uh, Fran and I had this idea that we wanted our farmers, our independent farmers, to tell their story about what it's like to be a Driscoll's grower. Mm. We went out and hired the production company they called The Farm League, it's a good fitting name. And they went out and started talking to these farmers and all they wanted to talk about were their workers. And so we go like, well, that wasn't really what we had in mind. Sure. So friend and I went back and asked for permission from our owners to create a documentary about farm workers. And um, we basically told the production company you go and do it, okay? It's uh, pretty much hands off, you know, from us. I mean, obviously, in the end, we wanted to see what we're going to put out there. And I think that you can see the stories that people are telling and mm -hmm. the passion and that they have about the workforce that they're responsible for, and all the challenges that they're having. And so, you know, it it did um, get finished in the middle of the uh, Trump administration, so it was a tricky time to really get it out sure. there. And once we finally had the courage to get it out there. Um, then COVID hit, you know, right? And so here we are, you know, a couple of years later. So we are really, really glad to get it out there. It's been living in the public ether for a little bit now, and now it's really going public. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about that courage. Why does it take so much courage to get a film like this out here? What I appreciate about it is that the farmers are raising these issues themselves. It's, I, I, you know, I know for a fact that they're not scripted. And, and that they're, they're talking about these issues in a really real and concrete way that I think all of us can understand. It, it makes it really sort of tangible for folks. Like we see Driscoll's at our Whole Foods or at our you know, co-op or at our grocery store 
and now we sort of know the process of what it takes to get there and how difficult it is. I can tell you there were a lot of people that told those farmers, don't put your name on the film, mm. don't put the name of the farm on the film, because you're going to be the next ice raid. Mm. And I mean, there was a real fear. And then we sort of came to the realization that, you know what, that's probably not going to happen. You know, and if we do not have the courage to go out and talk about these issues, we're not really taking responsibility for the sustainability of our own business. I mean, not in the environmental standpoint, but in the, right. sort of the ability to have an ongoing business. And so I personally have become a huge advocate for this issue. We are part of the National Immigration Forum. We, we talk with their leadership on these issues in, in a, any forum where we can get to. And um, this is the single most important issue in our industry, that together and with the topic we just talked about before. I just came from a meeting in California to talk about water. All our water issues in California are climate change related. But those are the two issues that, that holds this whole business back and the opportunity for both farmers and farm workers to thrive. Absolutely. So I, again, I think if we can break this down a little bit, people don't really realize the work that it takes to get each of those raspberries, each of those blueberries, each of those strawberries to market. It takes knowledge, it takes expertise, it takes a lot of hard labor from farm workers fr who come mostly from Mexico, but farm workers all across the world are doing the same thing every day. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that, how, you know, that, that uh, how, Driscoll's would not exist if it wasn't for farm workers. I mean, when you go to your local Whole Foods, there's only one person that's ever touched that berry inside the clamshell, and that's the farm worker. There is only one person that ever touches the berry before you open up the clamshell in your home, and I'll wash the berries first, and eat them, okay? You're supposed to wash them <laughs> first. Um, and that's it, you know? And so without the farm worker, this business doesn't get to exist. You know, we can grow blueberries and maybe we can machine harvest those and that's what you can have from Driscoll's, you know, machine harvest the blueberries. But you, we're not gonna machine harvest raspberries and blackberries right. and strawberries, okay? I mean, we are millions and millions of dollars in experimenting with robots, okay? And we will be many more millions of dollars in before it ever happens. And so that's the reality. And I think if you reflect back on the last two years living through this pandemic, the reality is that there's been food on the shelves every day. And it's only been made possible by the fact that farm workers showed up to work every right. day. Maybe my kids didn't get their PS5 for Christmas 2020 or 21, okay? But that is not a disaster compared to if the food didn't show up on our shelves, right? And um, you can't credit Driscoll's for that. I mean, we help making sure that they stay safe and all those things, but the, the farm workers' willingness to show up to work every single day and do the work that it takes. Um, it's what made it possible for food to be on the shelf. Yeah, you can't work from home when you're a farm worker like the rest of us. So yeah, no, I mean, and I, I think that's important to remember that farm workers bring every piece of food to your table every day, farmers and farm workers. And I just want to acknowledge that, that that doesn't get said enough publicly. I think we all, you know, kind of forget it. So thank you for that. Um, you know, you and I have talked about this a little. You, you immigrated, you're an immigrant. You've immigrated to the United States. And, and so I think parts of this film might strike you more than, than those of us who, you know, whose families have been here a long time who are not first generation or newly immigrated. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to put myself in the shoes of somebody that had to sneak across the border through the desert. Absolutely. Okay, so, I mean, I came in on a 747 and landed in Dallas, Texas in, on August 5th, 1989, and then drove to a place called Waco, Texas, okay, it was, you know, I mean, that seemed a little bit like a punishment so when, I, when I grew up in Denmark, <laughs> okay, so, so, so I would never hear from Baylor, okay, so, <laughs> and, um, so, no, I, I mean, I, I, so that's, I don't want to compare myself that way, but I, I am incredibly passionate about this issue. I think it doesn't really matter whether you come from the perspective of just uh, looking at what's right for humanity, right? I mean, you, the, the reality is that there is there are one million undocumented farm workers in this country, one million, and they deserve the dignity and respect of having legal status. They didn't just get here, arrive here yesterday. They're not the people you read about that's on the border today. Not that I, I'm not sympathetic with them. Many of them have been here five, ten, fifteen, twenty years and still don't have legal status. 
And whether they ultimately become a citizen with a U.S. passport or simply have legal status, th that to me should be the political debate. It shouldn't be a debate whether they deserve to stay here right. when they have fed us for this long. You can also... Can you say that again, Soren, when they fed us for this long? I mean, that's important. That yep. These are the people who feed us. I just want to keep reiterating that because it's not the food doesn't magically appear at the grocery store. That's the reality. I mean, unless the alternative is we import all our fresh fruits and vegetables that are ha have to be hand harvested. That the alternative, I don't know where the strawberries in the summertime will come from, but that's sort of the alternative. Which leads me to maybe the part of the debate that doesn't get brought up that often, which is that we as a country are very fortunate that we can feed ourselves. Right. There are many, many countries around the world that do not have that luxury. Some of the most powerful countries around the world that are in a food deficit will go very far to make sure that they get to being able to feed themselves, even if that doesn't mean growing the food inside their own border, but they will get it done somewhere else. Massive reason why China is all over Africa. We have that luxury in this country to be able to feed ourselves. We should not give that up just because we can't have an orderly debate mm -hmm. about immigration reform. And that will be the outcome, is that we will end up in a net deficit right. when it comes to food. And we'll be importing more food than we export. And the reality is we will only be growing, you know, corn and soybeans, okay, and a few other things, okay, which is difficult to live off and probably really not advisable to live off. And so the healthiest food that we still grow in this country will disappear because most of that is harvested by hand. So that leads me to a question that is always interesting to me because, you know, fruits and, and vegetables are often called specialty crops in the United States, and that honestly pisses me off because these are the, the, the foods that nourish us. And I'm wondering if, how, you know, how that strikes you, that the, the food that Driscoll is growing is called a specialty crop instead of something that people should be eating every day, fruits and vegetables. Yeah, I mean... I mean, luckily, if you go in the produce department, the number one ca category in the produce department is ber the berries, okay? So there's a couple of whole fruit people here in the audience, I recognize that uh, they can confirm that, okay? So that's a good thing. And that's consumers choosing that that's what they want and, and our ability to deliver it and hopefully improve the berries year after year after year and, and have the berries be better and better. Getting consumers what they want, whether it's conventional or increasingly organic, um, that's very, very powerful. I think that, that sort of will, will drive itself. We don't take any money from the government, unlike the corn and the soybean people, so we, you know, because we are specialty crops, okay, maybe we, maybe there's some research dollars that goes to a land-grant university, but yeah, that's, we don't get any help. And we don't want any help, okay? I mean, we'd rather that the other crops didn't get any help either, okay? Sure. And let's just let, it, let the consumers decide what they want, rather than having corn or soybeans produced, being produced at X cost, okay, for sold for Y price. Um, and sort of distorted, distorting the whole thing. So um, we are more than capable of, of, of competing on our own and having a successful business and cr helping farmers like we saw in the film create successful businesses. But this is a very, very labor intensive crop. It takes mm, about five people per one acre of strawberries, okay, to harvest the crop. If you're on raspberries, you're probably up to closer to 10. And that ends up being a lot of people. There will be 25,000 individ unique individuals harvesting Driscoll's berries in California this year. That number in Mexico on, on in the winter season is more like 65,000. So we're getting close to 100,000 unique individuals that are picking out berries. Wow. There's a huge responsibility for us. It's something I personally take very, very serious. I've worked on this issue for many, many years. It is a challenging issue, right? Because most of the uh, farm workers are they're migrating, even in Mexico. Okay, even if they're you know Mexicans come from the south of Mexico up to the states of Jalisco or Baja, mm -hmm. they're migrating. And this a uh, this is a global phenomenon. This we see this when the unemployment rate in Spain and Portugal were twenty five percent. We were flying harvesters from Nepal to Portugal to pick raspberries. Wow. Right, there were no Portuguese that showed up. A little bit like Miles Ryder sort of said in the documentary is that that is a bit the reality of being in a economically developed country is that going out to do farm work almost seems inappropriate. And I always get this question, why do you just pay them more? If 
the last 10 years, all labor-related costs, mostly driven by wages and benefits, have increased at twice the rate of inflation. Mm. For 10 years straight, not like just a couple of years, but 10 years straight, yet there are fewer and fewer people that show up, right? And uh, so these are not poorly paid jobs. These are difficult jobs, so that, so that the film certainly shows that. Uh, it's not easy. And I hate it when people say it's low-skilled labor because I, anybody that says this is low-skilled labor, I will challenge that person who got a pick strawberries for a day, okay, and they will never call it <laughs> low-skilled labor again, I promise you, okay? Right. So, yeah, the, the, this work is gonna get done by people that are, have the economic motivation to come and do the work. Right. And the reality is the way our world is put together in the Americas is that means that a worker is gonna come for now from Mexico, soon there won't be anybody left in Mexico that wants to, to, want, that, that wants to do this because we have employing them in Mexico. They will never come from Guatemala or Nicaragua and then maybe one day they will come from Cambodia. We will, like in Portugal, fly them in from Nepal. Yeah, that's, that's certainly not sustainable, is it? We need better policies. And we'll get back to that in a minute. I want to talk for a minute about the, the aging of, of both farmers and farm workers. And we saw, you know, one of the farmers retire. And partly, you know, he was getting older. Um, but also it's because of a lack of, of farm workers who are willing. It's a, as you said, it's a knowledge-intensive job. But it's a very labor-intensive job. Not a lot of young people, even if they're trying to migrate into the United States, want to do it. Yeah, I think what you see in the film is very representative of what it looks like on, on the farmer side is that you may think that most of the farmers that are out there is a white guy that owns the farm and does all this work. But the, the one guy that got to quit was the white guy, right? Yeah. For the patchy immigrant family from Ireland, their family uh, farm you know, for 75 years. It's not that Pat Shee, he doesn't have children in the family. James Shee, he was Pat's son, works for Driscoll's. Uh, James could easily have said, I'm gonna go and take over my dad's business. But I think James looks at this business and saying, this is too hard, right? And you saw Manuel Mac Magdalena saying, <laughs> my son doesn't wanna come up here in the field. Sure. So what you, what you mostly have, and, and, and both Manuel and Adelio that, that's in the film, they both came across the border when they were little children. They both became U.S. citizens eventually. They started as harvesters on the farm. They eventually saved up a little bit of money. They partnered up with somebody that was willing to fund them, and now they each own their own farming businesses. Odellis is much, much larger than Manuel's. And, and, and that is who owns the berry farms, okay? That may be different in other parts of the country, but that is who owns our berry farms. They are mostly a Hispanic owner of the farm, um, that is out there putting everybody to work, you know, cousins and everybody else sure. to make it all work, right? And um, that's the makeup. That's the vast majority of our 900 farmers. That's, that's who they are, right? The farm worker themselves, the, the average strawberry harvester in California is aging by 10 months per year. Mm. Okay, I'm just going to say that again. The average strawberry harvester in California is aging by 10 months per year. And on average, the strawberry harvester retires at age of 36. Wow moves on to another crop that's, you, sure. know, you know, where you don't have to bend over. So you don't have to do the math, that, that's, that's a train wreck, right? That's, uh, that's, and that's why you're seeing that the strawberry acres in California have been down, down, down. In. But there's not, a, um, there's not a great alternative to growing strawberries in California. That's anywhere else in the summertime in the United States, it's hot and humid and rainy. You couldn't grow it to Mexico, which was also hot and humid and rainy. The season in Canada is way too short. So if you want strawberries, they're gonna have to be, for now, grown in California until maybe one day we put them indoors and indoor farms. And we got millions of dollars in that too, okay? <laughs> but I can tell you, the cost of growing strawberries indoors today is very, very different than growing them outside. More like 10X, okay? So unless Whole Foods is telling us that they can sell strawberries for $24.99 a claim shell, okay? Then <laughs> Uh, it's it's going to be a while before we go that direction. Absolutely. I want to take a few steps back and go um, back to the beginning of the pandemic. And for me, you know, when I saw people sort of understanding the hard work that, that farmers and farm workers do and everyone along the supply chain, but particularly farm workers, I was kind of hopeful. I was like, oh, this is our moment. This is a moment for farm workers to, to finally be respected and get their, you know, 
get the the um, the honor that they need, right? And now that we're you know we're still not over the pandemic, we're coming out of it. Hopefully, knock on wood. I don't have any wood to knock on, but. I don't see that same kind of like interest in farm workers. And I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, what, what you think, how, how can we get that momentum back around caring about farmers and farm workers? Well, I think the most important thing is we have to have an orderly debate about this issue. I think that's why we created the documentary to challenge all of us to have the debate. I, as a more recent US citizen, incredibly frustrated by the idea that we are no longer permitted to have a debate on many, many topics, including the topic that was said earlier, climate change, right? We, we're not even allowed to have a debate in the Senate, right? right. I, I think that's sort of at the core of any democracy is the opportunity to have the debate. We don't have to agree, and in the end, the majority should prevail. That's how that works. But in this case, the majority doesn't get to prevail because the majority does want the kind of immigration reform we're talking about. And, uh, and we can have a slightly different version of it, that's fine, but we can't even talk about it, yeah. right? And so nothing happens. And that is incredibly unhealthy, and I am not optimistic that anything is gonna happen until you have a total disaster, right? Well, that is climate change or immigration Didn't we reform. have a total disaster with the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, but we thought you, we did, right? <laughs> but, but, but in the end, we, you know, like I said, we, we kept feeding people. And had the shelves gone empty, and we had lines out the door for people to get the few clamshells of strawberries, okay, which isn't, of course, the most essential thing that you have to have. I mean, we think it's essential, but it's not the most essential. Then maybe it would have changed. Sure. Right? And you would have gotten action. And um, that's unfortunately the situation we're in today, like Raj before, okay, I mean, I think it's, it's up to the people to stand up and say, we demand change. Absolutely. Right? And hopefully we're doing, you know, our, our little bit in that. Absolutely. I want to talk about the lack of protection for undocumented workers in this country right now, because it's, it's people are living in fear and they're working in fear. And I'm wondering if you can, uh, you know, speak about that. Yeah, I mean, I think you see immigrant communities all over the nation where, they are, they are unwilling to, or afraid to work with law enforcement, but they're also afraid to engage with local ofi uh, uh, officials that have you know, no agenda other than to help them out, right? We even saw that in many pockets in the, in the, during the pandemic with vaccinations and so forth, which is why we, one of the things we did very, very early on, we went out and worked with the immigrant community to really help them make sure that they understood that this was safe and there was nothing was gonna happen to them, but they weren't gonna get picked up by ICE or anything like that. But I think when, when somebody is just a, a broken tail light away from getting deported, right. and you've lived here for 10, 15, 20 years, that is always in the back of your mind. And I live in a community where we have many, many immigrants. I live in Santa Cruz, California. And it, that isn't, it's really unhealthy at so many levels, okay, obviously for the individual, but also for the community at large. And that is why I think you see, you know, police chiefs, you see pastors, and you see the business community uh, all together on this issue, right? This is, we're not always together, but we are totally together on this issue because of the things we see, right? Sure. The people that show up in the churches, the people that don't want to talk to the police, the businesses that can't get that work done. And um, and so it, it's, it's, it really is a human travesty. I'll give you an example of our home office is in Watsonville, California. The way the town of Watsonville, California used to operate was that our strawberry season starts around April 1st, they may go till October, so it's a very long strawberry season. And so people would show up in March and then they would be there, work the whole, the whole summer and into the fall, and then they would leave, right? Mm -hmm. And they would leave and they'll go home to Mexico, to the family farm, or whatever they were trying to build there ultimately, sure. right? Their, their opportunity, economic opportunity, was to come to Watsonville, make some money, go home and build what they really wanted to build. Now what's happening is that they can't get across the border, right? right? Because then they gotta get smuggled back in. And, and that's tens of thousands of dollars It's in some very, cases. very expensive, yeah. right? And they're incredibly dangerous, and there's a good chance you're not gonna make it, right? So what do they do? They stay with nothing to do, right? We, we, there's not enough work there. I mean, 
you know, for thousands of people in winter time. And so what you start seeing is really, really bad things happening. Like the town of Salinas, it was a major, major agricultural town in California. Uh, gang violence, the number of gangs is a way up, right? Because that's what ends up happening because the workforce that's there ages, they start having families, you know, kids grow up in that environment, okay, and with nothing to do, they figure out things to do. Right. Okay, or other ways to make money, unfortunately. Sure. And so that is just creates these massive problems and that the root cause is the policy is, 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 is the policy that's immigration reform is not a we not don't need some other policy on how to fight gang violence and stuff like that in Salinas. Okay, what we need to do is fix the immigration reforms. Absolutely. That's at the core of the issue. Thank you. You can repeat that again. We need to fix immigration reform. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to go back to something that we saw in the movie, which was putting uh, berries in pots to make it easier. And some, you know, you can pick while standing up. Um, how scalable is that? How how do you s envision that for the company, sort of five or ten years from now? Well, we already moved pretty much all of our raspberries and all our blackberries into that kind of growing system. And the idea is that you're creating a growing system that's more friendly for the harvester. So our whole calculation is basically there are five million hours available in the state of California to work on a farm. And that five million is gonna go down a little bit every year. And how can we best put that five million hours to work, right? So where we can get the our job done and the harvester can make the most money, amount of money possible. And she do that in different ways by changing the farm to make the farm more friendly to the, to the harvester. And, um, and so some of the systems work really, really well. Putting the, the strawberries up on the table has not worked as well. We do mm -hmm. that in other parts of the world. We do that all over Northern Europe. We do it in, on the, in Tasmania and Australia. Mm -hmm. We are 100% up on the tables. But the thing is, in Tasmania, it's, it's, it's college kids from Europe on vacation in Australia that want a visa to stay in Australia, come uh. pick strawberries for three months, and guess what? They're really, really slow. They're like <laughs> super slow. So when you put them up on tables, they get a little faster, so that works. The, our mostly Mexican workforce is very fast. Yeah. And when you put them up on tables, they don't get any faster, right? They, they, so, so we can't pay for all that infrastructure because productivity would be the reason why you would do it. Now, I mentioned we may have no choice to do it because if everybody ages out of picking strawberries, I mean, we can go and get the raspberry harvesters, which may be you know, into their 60s, go and pick strawberries on tables, right? But at a, and then a significantly higher cost. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's been our job. And we, I mean, I think we've made a lot of progress on that already. Sure, yeah. sure. One of the things that, um, and we only have a few minutes left before I want to turn to a few questions, that I, I think about um, every time I see this film, because I've watched it to prepare for this a couple of times now, is the massive amounts of food waste that poor immigration policy has impacted and everyone gets riled up about food waste I know everyone in this room is like probably a, you know a food waste you know an anti-food waste warrior but they don't get riled up about policy reform yeah and I'll give you an extreme example we talked about this coming down here this morning um, we estimate that we throw 100 million kilos so that'd be 220 million pounds of strawberries in a ditch every year because the berries are too small, misshaped. There's a few overripe ones in there too. Um, because we can't get enough harvesters to haul really the seconds out of the field. So the easy thing for us to do is we just throw them in the ditch and they literally just go to waste. Those berries could easily turn into you know, frozen strawberries, uh, purees and juices and many other things that innovative marketing people could come, uh, figure out what to do with. But the lack of labor in just in our case, the Druscos waste 220 million pounds of strawberries a year. Wow. That's not including all the fields that we can't get picked, right? And um, the, the, the reality is we will end up in a guest worker program. Th that is gonna happen. And um, I think the only question is, are we gonna be willing to give the one million farm workers that are here today the dignity and respect they deserve? There will be no doubt about that in 10 years from now, 90% of all the farm workers come in what was called the H2A farm worker guest visa. 
that'll be the reality because nobody else is showing up in the field. Right. And that's really the only question at stake. That is not a selfish thing for farming companies or companies like Druskos to do because the reality is as soon as they have full legal status and can leave the farm, they're not staying on the farm. They're gonna go on working a different job. But we feel very strongly that they have earned that right. And we as a nation, we owe them that right. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Soren. I'd like to turn to questions from the audience now. Bernie, there's one in the back or wherever you'd like to go. Uh, so for our grandparents, uh, berries would have been a much more of a luxury item, you know, more of a dessert, a treat, something you wouldn't necessarily have on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you think that maybe it, a uh, price point like $20 for a bunch of strawberries might be more of a reasonable, sustainable method going forward, more of, more of the luxury product? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of ways to redesign the food system, and you can be critical a lot of it. I think, I think that the, the reality is we are able to give people like all of you choice, right? And and I think that's 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 very possible. Okay, I, I don't think this is such a, a big problem that it can't be solved with just reasonable policy and still allow consumers all over to have the choice. The alternative is to say is where we can't agree on reasonable policy and therefore you can't have choice. That will naturally take care of itself, right? If, I mean, if we can't pick it, if we can't afford to grow it, then we're gonna make less available and it's gonna be more expensive, right? And then fewer and fewer people will buy it. So it will take care of itself, right? Obviously in the, the, the position I'm in, okay, I mean, I'm not that interested in reducing the size of our business to 120th, okay, and, and make it a hobby. I mean, that's not, that's not my job, okay? My job is to try to make it a successful business. So I'm a ca capitalist, okay? I believe in the capitalistic system, okay? I believe capitalism can be the most positive contributor to helping fix climate change, okay? It needs policy and guidance and rules and all that stuff, okay? Just like it can be a positive contributor to improving the lives of thousands of people. I graduated from a college just 90 miles up the street. When I got my first job in December 1992, I was asked to go down to a little town called Montemorelos, Mexico. That's where we were doing business. I remember going there and there were two cars in town. The one car belo belonged to our general manager, the other car belonged to the CFO of the company, and everybody else had a bicycle or arrived on a bus. Five years later, we had built three factories in that town. We had to buy a 200-acre uh, orange grove right across the street from our main factory because there were so many cars in that town. Now, you can say, okay, that's a problem with climate change and stuff like that, but it is an indication of economic progress in that little town that didn't exist until somebody, an entrepreneur, arrived with ideas about what they can do with the products that they could grow there. And I can take you all over the world. I can take you to Morocco. I can take you to China. I can take you to Tasmania where the apples industry was getting decimated by the Chinese and now has a very vibrant strawberry industry and that island of Tasmania still has a viable agricultural industry. So I believe in this business and the good that it can do and that's what I'm committed to. I'm not committed to making it a niche business that you can only have strawberries in, in the middle of the peak in June because that's the only time it's affordable. So, you know, I mean, that's where I come from. I mean, so. Is there another question? Bernie, there's some over here, sorry. Does anyone have a microphone? Oh, Emily, thank you so much. Are there any um, trending technological innovations that you would think we should be watching out for to see whether or not that could facilitate in both the productions of berries and also uh, help obviously with these farmers that are working so hard and meeting demand. Yeah, there's definitely lots of technology going on. Okay, there's some ag tech people in the room. Okay, th and there are hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into all sorts of technology in the agricultural space, including indoor farming, like truly indoor farming. Um, and th these are all technologies that have promise. They would be a long way from solving today's problems. 
they will not create nearly the number of jobs that the current industry creates. Um, so technology will solve a lot of issues. We are mostly using technology today to make sure that the, there's not a lot of wasted time in the field. One of the ways we pick strawberries today is you kind of saw we pick one crate at a time, and as soon as that crate is full, then the, the, the picker takes that crate and, and runs it out to the row where we put it on a pallet, right? And that back and forth between harvesting and running it out to the row is, is really wasted time. It's really time, what is it, it is time where they can't pick berries, right? So machines can assist with that, right? Conveyor belts and things like that. We can ro even little robots out in the field. And there's a ton of work going on with that, right? To try to reduce the waste, right? The growing systems, that's all about reducing the waste. And so there are plenty of technology that will sort of improve things over time. And but in the meantime, you got this one million people. This is a lot of people um, that have this status or lack of status. And th it will solve itself. If you just let time go by, the, of course, the million people will all be gone and there won't be an agriculture and they will have been replaced by guest workers. Okay, And we cannot like the guest worker program we have today because it lacks flexibility and it's expensive and there are also some issues with it. Okay, maybe that will get fixed on its own. But it leaves a really sort of a devastating situation behind because ultimately when all these people retire out of this industry, what exactly do they do, right? M most of them will not have homes to go back to in Mexico because they weren't allowed to go back and forth and build that home back home in Mexico or wherever they came from. So, I mean, big believe on technology and the, the progress technology can, and we make lots of investments in that. Um, but I think this film is really about the, the human part of the business, okay? And in, I think in fresh fruits and vegetables, that will always be there, always. Thank you so much. We have time for one more short question. So I saw the man in the hat, Emily. <laughs> Just a quick follow-up question as well. What do you see in the future of regenerative soil, living soil, and the use of those technologies? Will that increase more workers and hopefully help in the long run? What do you see in this future of permaculture? Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge believer in regenerative ag agriculture. I will, uh, one thing I think that would be good for you to sort of look at, and, and Raj brought it up a little bit in, in earlier this, uh, today, is you may think that the farmers that were in that film, they own the land that they farm. The problem is that in most cases, they don't own the land that they farm. In particular in California, the land has gotten very, very expensive. If you want to buy one acre of strawberry ground, probably $85,000 for one single acre, right? And you probably need 100. So the calculation of the farmer is, I, I don't want $8.5 million of my capital tied up in the land. I'm going to borrow that money to go and put it in the crop. The challenge becomes is that that strawberry farmer is not on that piece of land year after year after year. It's strawberries, then it's hopefully broccoli, which helps with the health of the soil. Then it's probably lettuce, which doesn't do anything good, okay? Don't like the lettuce people, there's some lettuce people in the room, okay? Don't like the lettuce people. And then if it's organic, hopefully it goes fallow for a year, right? With a mustard crop or something, right? That's what the best you can hope for. The question is who really makes the investment that you are after, right? is to make that farm truly regenerative. And that's a very difficult calculation because it might be Bill Gates that owns the land, okay, that's possible. Doesn't own that much of our land in Calif I mean, on the coast of California. It's more likely that it's an absentee owner that is three or four generations removed from the Croatian people that grew apples in the Pajaro Valley, which is the valley that we is, uh, is our home is in. Right, so they used to grow apples for people like Martinelli's. You ever have Martinelli's juice? That's in our home valley. And guess what? There are not too many apples left in that valley. Uh, but that's who owned the land, and they, they never sold it. And now they're just clipping a rental coupon, right? And you have to convince those owners to make the investments in that land to turn that land into what it really should be, right? Uh, you can work around it, okay? There are a lot of things we're doing in our home valley, in the Pajaro Valley. We have led an initiative. We're one of the few agricultural valleys in California that don't get any water from the outside. We only have the water that falls or runs into the valley. We had a major overdraft of the aquifer, which is, was just a ticking time bomb, right? We rallied together with some other community leaders. 
uh, the whole community together and said, we have to figure out how to fix this, right? And everything from how can we recharge the aquifer, how can we use less water, putting meters everywhere, how can we use the wastewater from the city and clean it up and put it back on the farms, which we are per perfectly willing to do. And we are on a very clear path to that that valley will now be 100% in balance in its water usage forever, right? So that's an example of doing some of what you're talking about. But I, th I think the, the, the ownership structure of the land, of all agricultural land, increasingly worldwide, is a fundamental problem to really make agriculture fully and truly sustainable in the long run. That th great way to end this. Uh, um, thank you so much for your openness, Soren. I want to thank you all. This, these are difficult conversations, and I, I want to applaud you all for being here and being part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you.